All right, uh, so let's continue on with the example that we were working on uh, in class. So where we had left off is we had uh, determined the support reactions here at joint C uh, and at joint E. Uh, and we had also started to go through some of our uh, joint analyses and we had completed two of them. If you scroll down here, I, I have sort of a, a, a blown up view uh, of the truss and you can see I've got each of the joints drawn. So imagine I sort of uh, sliced out each of those joints and sort of uh, exploded that view of the truss so that um, each of them were sort of uh, uh, drawn all on, uh, on one image. Uh, maybe I should go and also uh, label these. So we'll say that this is joint A, this is joint B, this is joint C, uh, this is joint uh, D right here, uh, and this is uh, joint E. Okay. So we've solved two of the joints, uh, uh, but as you can see, some of the members uh, still remain unsolved, so we need to uh, figure out what's going on uh, with all of them. Uh, before I do that, though, I, I kind of need to talk a little bit about um, uh, sign conventions uh, and, and how that transfers uh, when, you prefer, or when you perform a method of joints analysis. So uh, first thing to, uh, to recognize uh, is, is uh, how do you identify tension versus compression. So um, I'll say two items. Uh, item one, identifying identifying tension versus compression. Okay, so let's say we have a joint, and I'm just, you know, going to put this joint uh, out here in space. And let's say we've got, you know, three members framing into it. And let's say there's a load, you know, right there. Okay. And so what we've done is we've done our uh, method of joints analysis, and we found some internal forces. So let's say we have one of the members experiences uh, a force that's uh, uh, like this. Okay, uh, this force, as you can see, uh, is pointing away from the joint. Okay, this force would be a tension force. And so, you know, think about it like this. You know, imagine you have uh, a wall, and let's say, you know, here's you. That's the, the worst image, uh, or the worst artistic image I could draw, I know. Uh, and let's say that there is, you know, some sort of hook hanging out of the wall, and there's a rope tied uh, to the uh, uh, to the to the hook, and you've got the rope and, and you're yanking on it. How would you apply tension to that rope? Well, you would pull that way. You would pull away from the joint. So this would be a tensile force. Uh, similarly, if you had a force going like this, pointing towards the joint, this is compression, okay? So first off, you know, that, that's something that we need to, uh, to be able to identify. So for instance, if we scroll down here uh, and we look at some of our results, uh, if we look, let's say, at member AB, Member A, B, we can see if we look at joint A, we have this force that's pulling away from the joint. That has to be uh, in, uh, that, that's a tensile force. This 1,500 pounds would be in tension. Okay, so that's a tensile force. Okay, similarly, if we look at, you know, this force right here, this would be member A, D. Member A, D is experiencing compression. Okay, uh, and so what would be the force? Well, it would be in compression, and it would just be the square root of 1,500 squared, you know, plus 2,500 squared, uh, whatever that answer is. I believe it's 2,500, uh, and it would be in compression. Okay, that, that, that's pretty easy. All right, let me erase this because I'll, I'll summarize these results uh, down here at the bottom. Okay, so that's the first thing you kind of need to recognize uh, is, is how to identify tension or compression. The other thing that's worth mentioning, and it does uh, happen sometimes uh, when you're performing a truss analysis, it's uh, it probably won't happen too much with the trusses that we had solved in this class, but it is possible that you know we have some members that are compression are experiencing compression, some members are experiencing tension. 
it is possible that some members experience zero force. That, that is possible. You know, it's like, for example, it's akin to the reactions. Remember when we solved the support reactions, we had, you know, uh, we had a, um, uh, a horizontal and a vertical reaction at joint C, but we have looked at the truss and we recognized that CX was zero. You know, you had a reaction, just the value was zero. It's possible that you have a truss and one of the members contains zero force. That is entirely possible uh, when you are, um, when you are uh, doing these types of problems. So that's definitely something to keep in mind that you could have a, a, a zero force member. Okay, now that's the, the first thing that we want to be able to identify is identifying tension versus compression. If you have a force pointing towards a joint, it is uh, in compression. If it's away from the joint, uh, it's tension. Okay. Now, what about the second thing? The second thing is transferring results to adjacent joints. Okay, so when we're transferring results to adjacent joints, and let me, um, let me, in the interest of making sure I don't squinch this, let me drag this down a little bit. Okay, so when you're transferring results to adjacent joints, the, the best example that I can think of is a tug of war. Okay, so let's say, you know, here's the ground, and we have, you know, person A right here, and person B right here. Again, I know. Wonderful artwork. And there's a rope between them. Okay, so they both have a hold uh, of the rope and they're playing tug of war. So they're pulling apart from one another. So let's, let's recognize what they're doing from a physics perspective. Okay, so the first thing that they're doing is they're applying tension. That's the first observation. But the second observation is how are they applying tension to the rope? Okay, they are doing that by each pulling in the opposite direction, right? So, you know, if, per, if the person over here on the right is pulling with 50 pounds and the person on the right is pulling with 50 pounds, okay, that would be a static situation because the sum of the forces in the x direction would be zero. And what that would indicate is that the rope is experiencing 50 pounds in tension. And so similarly, what if it wasn't a rope? What if it was, I don't know, some sort of like beam that they had between them? And instead, they were both pushing it. They, uh, it, they would be applying compression uh, in this case. Now, what I'm interested in focusing in, in order to explain what's going on, are these arrows. Notice how the arrows are both uh, of equal magnitude, but opposite direction, right? One's 50 pounds to the left, the other's 50 pounds to the right. That's because on the other side of the member, that, that the force has to be applied in the opposite direction in order to produce a result that's either in tension or compression. And so how does that translate to a, a method of joints analysis? Okay, so with that, I think we've got enough information to start tackling this problem and finishing it out. Okay, so here's the, the joint problem. And so I've done a lot of the labeling for us. I've, I've put all the slope ratios on all the members. This For this truss, all the slope ratios were the same. They were all six to eight. So that, that'll make a lot of our computations really easy. Okay, what we've got to do is we've got to transfer these results to adjacent joints, okay? So let's take a look, for instance, at joint B, okay? Now, what are, what's going on here with joint B? There's one, two, three, four members at joint B, okay? But I know the internal force in two of those members. And the forces that I know are this and this. Well, you know, it goes back to the tug of war. If I have, 50, let's take the, uh, the AB. If I have 1,500 pounds on one side of the member, 
I'm going to have 15 pounds on the other pointing in the opposite direction. Okay. What about the BC? 5,250 pounds? 5,250 pounds. And so that's how you transfer results to the opposite joint. They have to be pointing in the opposite direction. Both of those forces pointing away from the joint. Similarly with diagonal forces. Okay, let's take a look at joint D. 2,000 pounds going up, so 2,000 pounds going down. 1,500 pounds going to the left, 1,500 pounds going to the right. What about over here at joint E? Okay, joint E. 7,000 pounds going up, 7,000 pounds going down. What about over here, uh, the 5,250? 5, 5,250. Equal magnitude, opposite directions. Okay. All right. So in order to solve the rest of the truss, it's sort of like a puzzle. You just start going through and, and uh, attacking each of the joints uh, to assess um, the, the remaining members. And remember, when you're solving a, a truss, you always have to pick a joint that has a, a, no more than two unknowns. So we started with joint A because joint A had two unknowns. And then we went to joint C. Well, now we're actually in a, in a scenario where we can do any joint theoretically uh, all in, uh, 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 in any order. We could do joint B, joint D, or joint E because uh, they all have two unknowns, right? Joint B has the two diagonals. Joint D and E each have a diagonal and a, um, a horizontal. So let's label those. I'm, I'm just going to sort of put these labels kind of like that. Like that. And then like that. Okay. Now, theoretically, I could solve for any of these. Okay. But... Um, what you'll see here in a second is that it's actually going to be a bit easier to handle one of these lower joints than it is to go ahead and start with joint B. Now, now to be clear, you could start with joint B right now. Nothing theoretically says that you should stop that. But, and, and this is just from a practical standpoint, uh, and this is sort of, I guess, one of Dr. Mike's tips and tricks. Um, if you can avoid doing a joint that has two diagonals, like, try and avoid that. Um, the reason why is because if you have a joint that has two diagonals, more often than not, in order to solve that joint, you're going to have to break out your Casio and do the, the two equations, two unknowns uh, uh, solution. So, uh, if, you know, in, in that scenario, if you have a choice, try and do that joint last. So, instead, I'm going to pick one of the lower joints. That really doesn't matter which one, but I think I'm going to focus on joint D just because there's less stuff going on on joint D. Joint E has a load on it, so it just seems a little easier to handle the one that has uh, less components. So let's look at joint D, okay, and I'm going to erase these uh, components here because I just want to focus on joint D. Okay, so I have two uh, uh, horizontal components and I have one vertical component. So let's look at the vertical component. I have 2,000 down. So this has to be 2,000 going up. Okay, what about the horizontal? Whenever you solve for a vertical, you should be able to directly solve for the horizontal, and we use the slope ratio, okay? And so the question is, first off, we know the direction, because if one's pointing away, then the other has to point away, so it's going to point away. All right, so it's going to be 2,000 pounds, and it's going to be 2,000 pounds times either 6 eighths or 8 six. okay? And so you have to figure out, okay, which one is it? Is it 6 eighths or is it 8 six? And the easiest way to, uh, to, to, to figure that out is to just look at your slope ratio. See how the smaller number is on the horizontal axis? Because the smaller number is on the horizontal axis, we use the smaller fraction, so we use 6 eighths. This ends up being 1,500 pounds. But you actually didn't really even need to do any math for this uh, joint or this diagonal member because, look, this diagonal member, this AD, 
is at the same slope ratio. And so since that vertical component is identical, this had to be 1,500 pounds. So it's, it's really straightforward. So this is 1,500 pounds. I'm erasing that because I'm going to have a lot of other forces um, uh, as, I, as, I, um, as I write this out. So I wanted to have some room. Okay. And so now I look at joint D and I see, okay, what's going on with this, this horizontal? What's the deal there? Well, what do I have? I've got 1,500. So this is going to the right. That's going to the right. So if I'm, you know, looking at this, this force has got to go to the left, right? Because sum of forces in the x direction has to be zero. And what's the magnitude, right? So I got 1,500 going to the right, 1,500 going to the right. So I've got 3,000 going to the right. This force has to be 3,000 going to the left. And that's it. That Now look at it. That joint is completely solved, right? All the forces uh, up and down are equal. All the forces left and right are equal. 2,000 up, 2,000 down, 3,000 to the left, 3,000 to the right. And all of the diagonal components comport with the slope ratios of those members. We're good. That, that joint's done. So, you know, we, we, we can move on to the next joint. So maybe we ought to put some, you know, some, some uh, uh, identification here. So, you know, we did uh, this joint first. Or no, 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 sorry. We did this joint first. Then we did this joint. Then we did this joint. Okay, so which joint's next? Well, it doesn't matter. You can do um, either uh, joint uh, E or joint D. Um, I'm going to do joint E. Okay, so let's look at joint E. All right, so let's see here. What do we got? Well, you know, we see we've got the 10,000 pounds. We've got the 7,000 and the 5250 from the member that we already solved. Check this out. We also know this one. We know this is 3,000 pounds. Okay, and what do we know? Well, we know that uh, over here, it was pointing towards the joint. So over here, it's got to point towards the joint. Equal and opposite on either side of the joint. Okay, now what are our unknowns? Our unknowns are this and this. Now this has a really cool opportunity. You're going to see something really slick here. So check this out. Okay, whenever you are solving a truss, you're going to get to a point, if you use the method of joints, you're going to get to the point where you sort of run out of unknowns, right? So, you know, uh, you're, you're going to, this is going to become very clear when we look at this joint because when we look at this joint there actually aren't going to be any unknowns because we'll have the whole whole truss solved and, and you'll see that here in a second but I want to show you something kind of slick okay so let's take a look at, at, at uh, the numbers here okay so I have what do I have here let's look at our numbers I have 10,000 going up right and I have 7,000 going down so this has got to be 3,000. Now, here's the thing. I can use the slope ratio to figure out what this horizontal component needs to be. I could do that right now. I could take 3,000 times 6 over 8. But let's hold off. Let's not do that. Okay. Let's just look at this independently. Okay. What do I have going on here? I've got 5,250 going to the left. And then I have 3,000 going to the right. So if I have 5,250 going to the, to the left and 3,000 going to the right, what does this need to be? Maybe, I don't know, 2,250? Right? Just do the subtraction. But here's the kicker. What is 3,000 times 6 over 8? It's 2,250. So you get to a point where the trust sort of self-validates your analysis because when you get done, the answers have to comport with equilibrium. And if you really want an investigation that, that your, your analysis is correct, look at the very last joint. Usually when you're doing a trust analysis, it's a good idea to save the most complicated joint for last. But really, when you do the trust analysis, you shouldn't have to necessarily solve that joint because the joint should already be figured out for you. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the joint. Okay, we have 1,500 pounds going to the left, 
you know, we've got, you know, that point force there, and we've got this force here. As for the diagonals, the diagonals are also already solved for. So let's transfer those over here. So 3,000 down, 3,000 up. 2250 to the right, 2250 to the left. What about over here? 2,000 up, 2,000 down. And what do we have here? We have 1,500 to the right, 1,500 to the left. Now let's take a look at this joint. Let, let's, let's sort of, let's sort of like, assess what's going on here. Okay, first off, you know, there are no unknowns for the joint. The joint's already figured out. But does the answer make sense? Okay, does the answer comport with equilibrium? Well, let's see. Let's start off with the forces in the y direction. What do I have? I've got 3,000 going up. I've got 2,000 going down. I've got 1,000 going down. So 3,000 going up, 3,000 going down, Everything checks out. Now, let's let's look at the uh, forces in the x direction. So, what do we have? We have let's let's see if we can isolate all the forces going to the left cuz I got 1500, 1500 and 2250. So, what is what do I add all that up? Okay, so uh, 15 plus 15 is 30, so 3000 plus 2250 is 5250 to the left. I've got 5250 to the right. So, this joint was already figured out. See, I, w I was really trying to, as, as I did the problem, I was really trying to keep up with a color scheme to try and be consistent. And so the green uh, represent the forces that transferred over, and then the blue were the true unknowns as you looked at a given joint. And you can see that that last joint had no unknowns, but that last joint served as a check that everything was correct. Okay. So this is a really cool way of uh, assessing your, uh, your, your problem uh, at the end. So if I wanted to summarize the, the final results of the trust, uh, the trust analysis, I could do that. And I'll show you the, 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 the sort of the, the neatest way to do that from a formatting perspective. Um, I'll, and I'll show you, show you that down here. So this is sort of how I like to see uh, trust results uh, presented uh, you know, as a final answer. And I basically like to see the truss reproduced with all of the forces directly written on it. So we'll say summary. And this is the final answer. So let's sort of redraw the truss like this. And Probably should have maybe tried to use a straight line tool there or something. And maybe we'll do that. I know I used like open circles when I drew the joints up here. And now I'm using like these filled in dots. But that, that's fine. Okay. So let's see the loads. I had 2,000, 1,000, 7,000, 10,000. So 2,000. 1,000. I had 7,000. And keep in mind, this was a this was a reaction, right? And then I had a reaction here, and this was ten thousand. Okay, all right. And then maybe for the sake of, of, of completion, we'll put some dimensions on here. So. Six foot, twelve foot, six foot. Again, if you're doing this by hand, yeah, you know, use a straight edge. And then this dimension is eight foot. Okay. In order to summarize the final answer, what I kind of like to see is you just write the forces on the truss. So, you know, remember this is joint A, B, C, D, and E. So let's write the forces on the truss. And let's start off with the members that are going horizontal. So let's look at member AB. Okay, so member AB is experiencing, there's a one there. Uh, member AB is experiencing 1,500 pounds. So this is 1,500 pounds. 
And then we have to identify whether or not it's tension or compression. Well, if I look at both forces, both forces are pulling away from the joint. So the easiest way to do this is just look at any one of the joints, okay? And see how the 1,500 pounds is pulling away from the joint. That indicates that this member is experiencing tension, okay? What about BC? BC is experiencing 5,250 pounds, and both of those are also pulling away from the joint. So 5,250 pounds in tension. Okay, so there's that. Uh, this horizontal, now look at this horizontal. We're talking about member DE. 3,000 pounds, but it's in compression. It's because it's pointing towards the joint. So this is 3,000 pounds in compression. Okay, and like I said, it is possible some of these members could be zero. You know, you could think of the tension maybe as like a positive force and the compression as a negative force. So it's possible it could be zero, that too. None of that happened on this problem, but it, you know, that, that, that is a possibility. All right, so uh, we keep on going. Uh, now, notice how the rest are diagonals. How do we deal with the diagonals? Again, we use the Pythagorean theorem. So for instance, I'll just do one as an example. So let's take member AD. So if I wanted the force in member AD, the magnitude would be, you know, 1,500 pounds squared plus 2,000 pounds, 1,000, I'll rewrite that, 1,000 pounds squared. And I'm doing that because I'm just using that and that. And it doesn't matter which joint I look at because it's the same values. Um, it's just a function of, you know, uh, plugging it into Pythagorean theorem. And I get, you know, 1,500 square, yeah, 1,500 squared, um, 2,500 squared, or sorry, 20, or 2,000 squared. That's 2,500. Okay, so member AD is experiencing 2,500 pounds. And then it's a function of whether or not it's in tension or compression. Whichever joint you look at, they're pointing towards the joint. So this member is experiencing 2,500 pounds in compression. And so maybe a good exercise is before you even do the math, just look at it and go, which are compression, which are tension? So if we're looking at diagonal BD, that's in tension. Diagonal BE, that's in compression. Diagonal CE, that's also in compression. And so the rest is just plugging and chugging this out. So if I look at member BD, member BD is also going to be 2,500 pounds because both of those components are the same. So 2,500 pounds in tension. Uh, the last ones we've got, let's see. Uh, let's see if I can do this. So... Okay, so I'm looking at member BE. So force BE is the square root of 2250 squared plus 3000 squared. And so when you chug that out, it ends up being 3750. So member BE is experiencing 3750 pounds, and as you can see, it's in compression. Both arrows point towards, toward, point towards the joint. And then our last member uh, is member CE. This one, if you recall, we actually solved this one in our previous set of calculations. Um, what the, you know, what we did in class, the idea was to try and show you sort of the complicated trig way of doing it. And then what I want to do here is say, you know, there's a much easier way to, uh, to go about this. And so this is uh, uh, going to be, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and repeat that calculation here just for the sake of completion. So F, um, what is it, uh, CE, and then we're looking at this, um, we're looking at this diagonal member right here, so it's 5250 and 7000.
And so that is 8750 pounds. And it is in compression because both of those are pointing towards the joint. And so what is the answer? This is the answer. And look what you got. You've got all of the reactions solved and you know all of the internal forces inside every member in the truss. That's the goal of solving a truss is to determine all of the internal forces in all of those members. And so hopefully this, this really sort of clarified uh, that, um, uh, uh, that solution. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, and, and with that, I hope everybody has a great week. We'll see you all on Monday.